Welcome to this first Better Together webinar of 2024. My name is Sally Chen and I will be your host for today. Please feel free to yeah, introduce yourself in the chat. And um, so this webinar's theme is Unlocking Connectivity with Persons and Identifiers. And uh, we will hear from all three organizations, uh, Crossref, DSI, and ORCID. Uh, so like a brief introduction of Better Together if this is first time you're here. And it, this is the third year of the webinar series. Like similar to previous years, we prepared three webinars led by each of the collaborating organization to take you through the most important topics in scholarly infrastructure, persistent identifiers, and open science. So this year we have also made some adjustment to the format compared to previous years we will have 60 minute sessions instead of 90 minutes, making the agenda more compact and more engaging. And we will not limit the time to APAC time zone so that other communities can also take advantage of this occasion. So expect two other webinars later this year. The next one will be on September 4th, if you want to mark your calendar right now, and the last one in November. So we'll also be promoting them through our usual socials and newsletter channels. And this is your uh, tip to start following us on social media. So following the tradition of this webinar series, we hear from all of the three organizations. First, today we'll have Joanne Obanda, from, uh, the Community Engagement Manager at Crossref. But this time, uh, Johansson will put on the roar hat today and walk us through the critical role uh, research organization registry identifiers play in connecting research. Then we'll hear from Mohammed Mustafa, uh, the regional engagement specialist focusing on Middle East and Asia at data site. Um, uh, uh, Mohammed will talk about uh, the different uh, different services and programs at that site that are geared towards creating connections whenever possible. And finally, we have Estelle Chen, uh, engagement manager at ORCID to highlight the interconnection and interoperability between ORCID and DOI infrastructure and how researchers can take advantage of it. Um, please remember to use the Q&A feature to send your questions to the speaker as the pre uh, presentations proceed and we'll try to address them after all three talks. So without further ado, let's hear from Johansson. Johansson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Shelley. Um, yeah, good morning from Kenya. Also, um, good evening, good afternoon from everyone else joining on from a different um, uh, time zone. My name is Johansson Obanda, and I'll be sharing uh, with you about uh, one of Cross of Com Community Initiative, which is also shared across our three organizations here today. Um, yeah, I'm just going to start sharing my screen right now. Um, yeah, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Great. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of introduction about uh, Crossref. So Crossref is a nonprofit membership organization that is existing to make scholarly communications better. Uh, Crossref makes research objects easy to find, cite, link, and reuse. And um, uh, the vision of Crossref is um, a rich and reusable open network of relationships that is connecting, uh, that is connecting uh, people, organizations, things, and actions, and a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. And this is what we also call the research nexus. And uh, metadata, or rich metadata, otherwise is the thread that is woven uh, to produce such a network. Uh, so on next with my presentation. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, ROAR, which is uh, one of course of the community initiative. And um, uh, it is a community driven effort, uh, 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 the research organization registry. Uh, and uh, it's currently led by uh, steering organizations, including California Digital Library, 
uh, Crossref data site. And um, you can read more about the origins of the project and the uh, activities of our initial working group on our website, uh, uh, raw.org. Yeah, the project is aimed uh, specifically on addressing a basic and high level affiliation use case, uh, what organizations are affiliated with, what research output, and that is um, uh, also supported by uh, persistent identifiers or, and so we, we, we keep in the scope very focused on building a single top level registry of truly open identifiers for organizations that conduct research. And we're not trying to identify all legal entities or capture affiliations at the departmental level. So we are working at this high level to allow more granular options out there to interpret with this registry. And um, this is an example of a, of a raw ID uh, over here um, uh, for this organization, uh, Chula, Hong Kong University. And, and so you also find a few other identifiers on the on the right side of my screen. So I'm I'm just gonna uh um advance my slides and there's just gonna be another example uh like this later on. So why raw um uh just as I mentioned or hinted earlier that raw is a global community led registry of open identifiers or open persistent identifiers for research organizations. And um uh, also, because Roy is an established, trusted, and no cost widely adopted service for identifying research organizations and also funders, uh, that is becoming a global standard. And um, uh, just also to mention later on uh, in September, we have a uh, we, we will have a, a more detailed presentation uh, on Roar and um, it, and and that will also touch on how uh, Crossref. Um, Find the IDs transitioning to raw. Um, another reason about uh, why you should have raw or why raw is it because raw makes information about research organizations clean, uh, normalized, and easy to exchange among software systems so that journal articles that set and other research output can be reliably associated with universities, funders, companies, laboratories, and other institutions. Also, raw. It's only role that offers a free, open, easy, curated, community-led solution that research organizations uh, metadata to travel freely between thousands of scholarly uh, systems. And um, yeah, this is another example. So um, we can search and browse raw records at raw.org slash search and, um, and, and, and literally uh, search for any uh, organization or funder, and then you will find um, all that uh, information, if they have other names or and, and the type of organization that, that is, um, the other relationships uh, that it has and also other identifiers. For example, if it is a research producing organization or is also a, an, a funder, for example, you find other identifiers that, uh, that go along with it. And then also um, basically all the important information about it. And also uh, some, sometimes you might not find an organization um listed on, in the search engine and you you would want to curate or to propose to that organization uh to uh, suggest addition to raw and and that has happened a lot um because like raw is uh is curated by the community and uh would depend on that community effort so much to capture many organizations and funders um yeah there are more than one one hundred thousand um records on raw um and then uh, another important thing to uh, uh, to point out is like it's searchable on the web, uh, and also you can easily uh, request changes and additions uh, to raw records, and that would usually take between two uh, to four weeks to process. Um, and then uh, the other uh, thing I would want to uh, say. Uh, the other uh, what raw serves or what raw enables is like um it it, it enables the collection of research uh, institutional affiliate affiliations so for example um oh, as as orchid um is identifying researchers or uh, and uh, as orchid is identifying researchers and uh raw helps as well now to um bring into the picture the institutional affiliations of the researcher. For example, while ORCID, while, while Crossref and data side, um, at the basic level would help to identify the research output 
of the researcher of the of or of the institution, and and that um leads to a, like a very comprehensive connection or network, um and it also helps to standardize it in, in this great organizations names uh because like some are closely related and it helps to make sure that there's a difference between those, um it also makes or additionally or contributes to making research research easier to find, uh. And also it improves affiliation with data in the global research ecosystem. And that's quite important uh, of bringing into the picture about, uh, more about the institution itself that the research is being done from and also the funding. Um, yeah, and then now there's the key systems that use RR uh, that does include the, um, does include all of our organizations here, Crossref, data site, and OK, also, um, open access switchboard, and then there are knowledge graphs also that uh, use uh, RR, including open Alex, Lens, and your uh, PMC, and repository systems like that. I'm going to show you uh, an example, and then there's Nodo and Figshare. Uh, publishing systems as well, like Scholastic or Open or OJS, and then uh, Triple AS, uh, Science uh, Journals, and more. And then you can find out more uh, in the RR community slash adopters. And then um, as I get on close to winding up, um, so our role is designed for research workflows. So users submit research in a system integrated with the role. And then organization is selected from a role powered uh, control list. And then that is, um, and then shared metadata um includes shareable metadata includes the raw id and system user raw id to track research by organization uh, this is a, a dryads uh, use case for example uh you can find an institutional affiliation uh by um uh just entering and then allowing it to to uh populate and then selecting uh the the um the correct uh, institution and this is because I dried or uses a raw service to be able to get um institutional affiliation metadata. Um yeah, so RAW is operated as a collaborative initiative by California Digital Library cross Surf Data Site as part of each organization's ongoing operation budget. RAW does not depend on grants or on fees, uh, and it cannot be transferred to a commercial entity. And then it's also committed to their uh POSI, which is the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, yeah, and lastly, uh, if you want to do more with raw, you need to consult your technical documentation at raw.readme.io uh, for help integrating raw into your own systems. Also, you can ask your colleague and vendors to adopt raw, and you can share links to this presentation and register to attend any raw events or get involved in the raw community. Um, yeah, I believe these um slides will be available after the um after the call. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, also please use the Q&A for any questions that you might have about Raw. Great, thank you. Thank you, Johansson. That is very important and useful information about Roar Registry. Um, actually, in our work uh, for the uh, Global Access Funding, we have recently uh, submitted a couple of requests for the addition of uh, some uh, in institutions to the Royal Registry to help us with our facilitation of the uh, registration of the small grants that we're issuing through the GAF funding. So uh, really expect to see uh, the institutions being added to the registry, which is a great segue to uh, introduce Mohammed to um, talk to us more about uh, DESS initiatives and the services. Thank you so much, Shaoli, and thank you, uh, Johansson, for the detailed presentation about role. I hope that you all can see my screen now. Hello, everyone. I am Mohammed Mustafa, the Regional Engagement Specialist for the Middle East and Asia at DataSite. Yeah, so let's start with a quick introduction about DataSite, who we are. So we are a global community that shares a common interest 
Our goal is to ensure that all research outputs and the resources are openly available and connected so it can be uh, reused to advance knowledge between different subject areas and also now and in the future. So as a community, we make research more effective. How we do that? By using the metadata information that can connect the research outputs and the resources. So in the topic of connections, we are going to clarify and share more details about how we make these connections possible. So we uh, support our community by allowing them to register uh, DUIs for all their research outputs from samples and the images to data sets and the preprints. We also built integrated services to improve research workflows and facilitate the discoverability and improve also the visibility and the reusability of their research outputs, as I will explain later in my slides. We are also a non-profit organization registered in Germany since the year 2009. So this is a snapshot from uh, the current data site community. As you can see, we have more than 3,000 repositories connected with us and using our infrastructure. Uh, these repositories are coming from 52 countries. So far, we have registered more than 60 million DUIs. And overall, we collaborate and we work with 1,400 organizations around the globe. So data site DUIs are suitable for a wide range of research outputs. The first one is the materials or the research outputs that are associated with a specific research process, such as data sets, collections, associated workflows, images, models, software, uh, and software script as well. We also support what we call the gray literature, such as thesis and dissertation, conference proceeding, uh, reports, preprints, technical standard, uh, all the materials that usually uh, the primary point of publication will be the institutional repository. So this is a screenshot from the data site registry. And as you can see, uh, the 1400 organizations that are members of the data site community are registering a wide range of research outputs from data sets, physical object to collection software, dissertation, output management plan, peer review report. So a wide range of research outputs and resources are being discoverable. So because we received that uh, question a lot. So why should I get DOIs for my dissertation or my samples or my, uh, why should I get uh, DOIs for my conference proceeding reports? So DOIs really help uh, and contribute to improving visibility and discoverability of your research outputs. They also enhance the accessibility and in the context of research data set, uh, you are being aligned with the FAIR principles as well, and you obtain recognition for all your research outputs as well when you start registering them with uh, DUIs. This can lead to more citation as we will explore that further in the next slides. And by also getting DUIs, you are connecting all your research outputs and resources with the global ecosystem. You are also increasing the impact, overall impact of your institution. As Obanda mentioned, we have part of the, uh, the metadata information that you register and you provide us when you register your research output is the ROR ID for your institution. So you are also increasing the overall impact of your institution and, and overall open science and open research principles. So in terms of connections, the main topic of uh, today webinar, so DataSite built an open platform called DataSite Commons. Within DataSite Commons, we are displaying information about the registered uh, DOIs that are coming from DataSite and some DOIs also that are coming from Crossref, in particular for the DOI that cited uh, research outputs that have data site DOIs. We also have an integration with ORCID API to display information about the contributors. We have an integration with ROR API to display an information about the uh, affiliated organization. And we have also uh, integration with uh, RE3 data, the data registry for the data repositories. So within the data site commons, we are building the relationship between all of these entities. So the organization, the research outputs that this organization are producing, such as software script or data sets or publication, 
We're also tracking that uh, organization who's funding this research. And of course, we are also tracking the person, the contributors who are producing this research as well. So within data site commons, for example, we are bringing citations to the surface. So this is an example of a data set and this data set has been cited five times. We are able to track the citation for these data sets because of the integration with different persistent identifiers. So how this is possible? So how we can make connections through the data site metadata? So first of all, what is the connection metadata? Connection metadata represent relationship connections between different entities. So as you can see in this particular example, if a paper cites a, a data that's it. This can count as a connection. If a person authors a paper, this is kind of a connection. We have a person is affiliated to an institution, or if a specific institution is funding a research output, or a data set is created or generated using a, spe a specific software. So what is the key properties for connections in the data site uh, metadata schema? So we have related identifier. So this related identifier is used for connection that is related to research outputs like citations or version of, and the typical identifiers are like DOIs or URL or handles. And we have also name identifier. So this name identifier for creators and contributors, and it's used for building connections that is related to authors and the contributions and the contributors using ORCID IDs for people or academic researchers in that context and ROR IDs for organizations. We also have affiliation identifier for, for institutional and institutions and organization. And this one is used for building connection to affiliated organizations using ROR IDs. And we have also fund identifier for funding uh, references. And this is used for connections related to funding organization using ROR IDs because recently also Crossref announced the transition of funder ID to ROR IDs. So related identifier in particular, they represent the relationship between a DUI and another identifier. And usually it will refer to another research output. So what we mean here is like data set to a publication or data set to, uh, to specific uh, code or a script or data set to another data set. So data set is citing uh, another data set or it's like a new version from the same data set, updated version. Related identifier relation types, we have different types here. So we have citation like this uh, research object is cited by or is referenced by or is supplemented to or is supplemented by. We have also uh, versions like this, a new version of this or is identical to this uh, research output. And we have various uh, research or, or related identifier as you can see on the screen because of the time constraint, I won't be able to go through all of them. And also we have related identifiers for uh, citations. So citations and references are links between various research outputs and you can always add citations and references to DOI metadata when you create the DOI initially with subsequent updates to the metadata. So as we can see in this table, it's a relationship between DOI A and DOI B. So is cited by, so A is cited by B is equal to like B cites a, and then you can build all these different relationship in the metadata schema, or you can say also is referenced by like research output A is referenced by research output B or is supplement to like supplementary to this one. So A supplement to B or A cites B or A is referencing B or A is supplemented uh, by B. So we have all these different relations within the related identifiers for citation. We have also the name identifier. So that represents a relationship between a DOI for a research output and a creator, a creator or a contributor. So this, in this case, you are, we are referring for the 
creator or the contributor you can link and build that connection with uh, with this entity using the orchid id for the creator or the contributor we have also the affiliation that represent a relationship between a creator or contribution which can be people or uh, organization and in this case you may refer and link to ORCID ID or to research organization registry or ROR ID. Also in terms of affiliation identifier in the data site schema, affiliation identifier equal to organization identifier. So several registries for organization IDs are available. Please consider that grid is no longer available. We always uh, at the data site, we recommend our community to use a research organization registry or R that uh, my colleague uh, Obanda has presented. Also for funding references that represented the relationship between a DOI and a funding organization that financially supported this work or this research output has been resulted because of that uh, particular fund. You can do that by linking to the ROR ID of that funding agency or that funding institution. So the data, uh, the, the data site metadata schema supports connection metadata through the related identifier, the name identifier, the affiliation identifier, and the funder identifier as well. Through this metadata, connections can be established between all of these different uh, entities and objects. So object and object, you can use the related identifier. Object and the people, you can use the name identifier object and organization, you can use the uh, affiliation identifier and the funder identifier as well. This is a, a very quick example about the power of, uh, of digital object identifier and how you can use it to uh, retrieve information. So I just will show you a, a quick demo. I think I already prepared the demo. So if you insert the, this DOI here and ask it to be formatted according to ABA or any particular reference formatting style. You, as you can see here, what is happening is this uh, DOI is going to the registration agency to retrieve the metadata information that has been registered uh, through the agency while getting or obtaining a DOI for this research output. And based on that, you can see we, can, we are able to see the contributor's name, we are able to see the publication year, we are able to see the publication title, details about uh, the publication uh, journal or serial where this conference proceeding has been published and the DOI as well. So imagine getting or uh, making all your thesis, all your dissertation, all your data sets, all your reports, all the research outputs that your university is producing, making them recognizable, by assigning or registering a DOI for each research output. And imagine also a scenario where you are providing rich metadata information or complete metadata information as much as you can. And all of these, uh, all of your research outputs are being discoverable and visible across several citation uh, and discovery engines as well. So this will be really, really great. And then you will start having like more, uh, your research outputs will make more and more impact. So at the end, this is an open invitation to join uh, the data site community. So there are different options for interested organization to join the data site community. The first option is a direct member. So the direct member, this type of membership is uh, supporting a specific organization that has one or two repositories. Maybe they have a general repository and they have a specialized data repository so they can start registering re, uh, DOIs for all of the research outputs. We can we have also a consortium model. This is a more sustainable model, support different organizations. So this is can happen when a group of like-minded organizations come together collectively to start and participate uh, in the data site community. So as you can see, then each consortium organization can join an existing consortium and they start connecting their repositories with data site infrastructure. We get that question a lot. Who can lead a data site DOI consortium? 
we have diff more than 60 consortium leads. And from what we are seeing is they are coming from various or different spectrum of organizations, such as national libraries or library consortiums, national centers for documentations in specific countries, university councils, ministries, research and education networks. So yeah, we are open. So please feel free to contact and connect with us if you are interested in starting a consortium in your country or in your region as well. Yeah, our community is growing, as I mentioned. We are supporting more than 3,000 repositories that are registering a wide range of research outputs. We work with different repositories in institutional, disciplinary, multidisciplinary. We work also with various repository softwares, whether you are using DSpace or OGS or Dataverse, we support various uh, repository software. And on top of that, we work with different repository sizes. So if your repository is publishing five or 10 research outputs per year, this is completely fine. And we have repositories that are publishing like five uh, million items in total. Yeah. So. At the end, this is uh, an open invitation for you to support open persistent identifiers and open metadata as well, because it can really help in improving transparency, research integrity, building the trust in the research ecosystem that we all are using, improve the communication and increase also the equity for everyone. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Muhammad. It's very comprehensive. Uh introduction to data size, different ways to connect uh, entities that live in the scholarly, scholarly research ecosystem. Um, yes, this is a reminder for the participant, all the participants to put your uh, questions in the Q&A if you have burning questions to ask any of our speakers. And next up is uh, Estelle from ORCID. So go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Shelley, and thank you, Mohammed and Johansson. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I'm a bit coughing, just to let you know. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me a second. Can you see my screen now? I see yes. Let me... Perfect, thank you. So, yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Estelle Chen. I'm based in Taiwan, and my topics today are kind of adopted from the famous proverb. Is <laughs> I hope you can guess. It's... No class, no connections, no gain. So yeah, it's funny from like no pain, no gain. So as uh, the theme of the topic today is really about connections. That's why we, I mean, not me, just all of us focusing on the connective connectivity among different research infrastructure or persistent identifiers. So um, let me just, yeah, I'm just going to quickly start with a very high level uh, um, introduction, but I think everyone now here understands. So the persistent identifiers and their metadata are really the building blocks for open research infrastructure. So PITs for researchers, PITs for organizations, PITs for fund, or PITs for research outputs. And they just not enable um, those entities can be uniquely identified, but more about connections and create um, reliable links among those different entities. And um, apart from identification, metadata about those organizations, people, objects can be formed reliably between systems and platforms and to reach interoperability and benefit both researchers and the overall research ecosystem. And I will talk a bit more about uh, how we collaborate. I mean, data cycles of ORCID collaborate so far in terms of different services for researchers. And uh, a famous quote I like a, a lot is that these alone do not provide much value. The value really comes through embedding kids in different systems and connecting to them, and visualizing those connections and leveraging relationships, which is more about connect connectivity as a thing today. And yeah, about ORCID. So just quickly begin, I hope everyone now also understand or heard about or hear about ORCID, just quickly also to mention. So ORCID is dependent now for profit relations registered in the US. It has been launched over a decade and now we are completely sustained by membership fees for organizations. And uh, we have a community governed board at which are actually elected by our member organizations. And ORCID provides three main services. The first is for the ORCID ID. So it's a unique uh, pers persistent ID for researchers or for people who contribute to research. 
it's free. It's open to individuals to register a wine for themselves. And the second is an ORCID record, or sometimes called ORCID profile. So it's a record profile connected to the ORCID ID, and it contains different parts of research information, like employment, education, research outputs, etc. And of course, the ORCID APIs that enable data exchange between organizations. And this is the OK record, as you can see, there are different types of research uh, information. And most of them are add, add, can be added by researchers or by member organizations using API. And there are two sections, peer review and resource, resources are open to members. So uh, just also a bit uh, more kind of current global participation. It's great that also grows. So uh, more globally, from, we have users pretty much around the world, and uh, more than 5,000 systems, nearly 6,000 6, are kind of embedding ORCID in the world research workflow, and more than 1,000 members globally, and more than 8 million active research rec uh, ORCID records. So, yeah, so, but as, you know, as it goes, we still can... There are some underrepresented regions or communities. So we also um, have some community initiatives that we want to work more closely for underrepresented communities. So we have the Global Participation Program. There are two parts. One is called Membership Equity Program. The other is about Global Participation Fund. So I'm not going to go through the details today. So if you are interested in more, learning more about a membership equity program, which is about forming OP Consortia, and uh, you can please visit our website. But I do want to introduce a bit more about the Global, Part Global Participation Fund quickly. So we provide funding grants that for um, underrepresented, underrepresented regions. So there are two types. One is for grants for community development outreach, it's about building all key communities of practices and more outreach and training support for underrepresented or new communities towards ORCID. And the other is more about grants for technical integrations, like software, open source, or mainly open source, open source software development. And now we have a PKP that was applied for this and also DSpace. Yeah, so that's a bit more about the initiative so far. So as I share, the highlights today shall be more about, you know, more case studies between ORCID and DOI. I mean, both cross the data, data side. Uh, uh, of course, open, open infrastructure providers and also uh, DOI providers. So I'm going to sh uh, share a bit more. So uh, OK facilitates, as a pit ourselves, we facilitate automation and reuse with different persistent identifiers. So from people, they actually will work with other people IDs too, like ISNI or Scopus ID or Web Science. And also ROWER is important for organizational IDs and also other research output IDs for sure. Yeah, as you can see a screenshot here, you know, different IDs kind of converge here. And um, there are three kind of main services uh, that enable full interoperability between uh, DOI and ORCID by our joint collaborations. So there are three, just uh, I would like to highlight. Uh, the first is that for researchers, you can add works using identifiers such as DOI. They are also, we also support other identifiers. For DOI, you can easily add any type of research outputs using DOI, uh, as long as your research outputs rather as DOIs. And most DOI registered agencies enable this. The second is Cloud Search and Link Wizard. It's a services built in the OK registry interface. So those are tools built by OK members that allow researchers to import information about publications or different types of works into your ORCID records from different databases. It's also beginning from the your ORCID records as in the screen um, shot here. And the third is called auto updates. And this is uh, more required kind of community collaborations. But the idea is for um, um, publishers or data repositories, you can start to embed authenticated ORCID IDs as a part of the DOI registration metadata. 
And then in the future, those DOI agencies can help researchers to update your future publishing ongoing works into your OP records. And this is an example from, I think it's from Ghostwriter. So I'm going to illustrate a bit more about the DOI auto updates that can save researchers time and in foster more trust. This is a um, uh, more delegated workflow. So for researchers, you connect your ORCID IDs during the research workflow, whether many is now it's a manuscript submission workflow or if you deposit your data into different repository. And publishers or repositories, you include those uh, IDs you collected from researchers uh, as a part of the DOI registration metadata, because when you need to register DOIs, you also need to supply some information. So ORCID ID, those uh, authenticated ORCID IDs is a part of it. And then those DOI agencies, now we also, uh, I mean, beyond data science process, which are more established and mature, well, we also have the Felix Center from Japan and Korea DOI support this. And um, the DOI agencies uh, will have your ORCID ID in the metadata and they will send you kind of a request to, to invite you say, yes, I want uh, those DOI agencies to help me to auto update my future research outputs into my ORCID records. And in the future, as long as these DO agencies uh, receive uh, new research outputs and contains those type of ORCID IDs in the metadata, they will help update your future, I mean, researchers' future published work, uh, research outputs into your ORCID records. And yeah, this is an example for researchers to start from um, signing with ORCID you know, during the manuscript submission process. And here are the results. You can see the ORCID ID is a part of the DOI registration metadata, and this can be auto updated into researchers' ORCID records. And this is, I hope this doesn't look as scary, but really this is the metadata. I think it's retrieved from Crossref, and you can see the ORCID ID is lively there. So, and it can, ship, can be shared between systems and reach interoperability. And just some more um, about real um, adoptions. Uh, so collaborations benefit all. So nearly 20 million works, publications, research output, uh, different types of research output are added to more than 4.2 million researchers OK records. And this is just uh, um, the more information from the cross of auto update. As you can see different, mostly journal articles also include like different conference paper, et cetera. And this is the data side um, so far, the, the contributions, and it really contains um, different types of uh, uh, research outputs, data sets, et cetera. And those um, both help the researchers, help the research community, because through this, more validated research information can be added into the OK registry, and further can be reused by different systems. So also just to mention, probably you already know, but you haven't, if you haven't. So there are empirical, there is empirical study about the adoption of kids, which can really save money. So there are studies in the UK and studies in Australia. So you can see um, the adoption of kids uh, is not something just more about slogan or um, words, it's really about actions. So, sorry, yes. Okay, recap and actions. So, yeah, just want to highlight the part as ORCID's mission and uh, as our, uh, we are always open to work with different PITS providers or different um, PITS, so transparent connections enabled by PITS and associated metadata. Um, researchers, organizations, and research outputs of research data will be easy to build in work. So um, for both individuals and organizations, you both play a role. So for researchers or any individuals, please register for your OKID and connect it with the any system that you encounter during the research workflow. And for organizations, uh, uh, please also uh, implement ORCID into your system. And you can apply for a free ORCID sandbox first to try out APIs and just contact us if you're interested in learning more. 
So yeah, thank you. And I hope our webinar today provides more um, illustrations about how different um, fields work together and how different those open research infrastructure can really collaborate to benefit research com community. And you also play a share. And yeah, these are some links and I'm going to pause here. And yeah, I think we are going to move to the discussion time. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Estelle. That's a great presentation going through all of the uh, features and uh, ORCID infrastructure provides to uh, support all the connectivities across the uh, uh, PID infrastructure and uh yes yeah, so we have a uh smaller crowd today so uh we as we enter the um discussion part uh participants like uh is welcome to directly raise your hand if you uh if you would like to ask a question directly to our speakers um but at the same time, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, this, I think this is a common question that, that come across, we come across, um, but uh, I would hear from all of the speakers about, um, so there are uh, many other services, um, persons identifier or uh, uh, other type of research supporting services like, you know, the archival uh, resource key, ARC identifier, or Google Scholar profile that's similar to ORCID. How are these other identifiers different from DOIs and ORCID IDs? So, uh, I still want to comment first. Yeah, I, I won't come on the DOI part. I will leave this to you. <laughs> yeah, I will comment more about the ORCID ID part for sure. So yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, actually, we got excuse me, we got a lot of kind of just questions because people, I mean, researchers are a bit confused. So uh, yeah, I think there will be like two dimensions I want to share. So the first is about the nature between. Google Scholar or Google and ORCID. As you know, Google is actually a commercial services, although we use it so much, but we need to bear in mind it's actually a commercial services. And um, yeah, so apart, so unlike ORCID or like Crossroad data set, we are really kind of um, open and non-profit. So Google Scholar is actually more closed services. So the information there, so you, you know, there are a lot of also some research like publications stuff um, in Google Scholar is not really shareable as far as we know by any APIs and the connection and data there are generated more by Google al algorithms because if you check Google Scholar you can see it just really say the cluster of those publications are really based on their internal statistic models that's the word they use statistic models. So it's really different from the approach we take more community. And we we are very careful about to ensure the source, you know, this data is at by who using what. I think that's really important. That and and ensure that also just to uh, ensure the data is more trustworthy in that sense, you know. And yeah, that's the first dimension about openness. You know, Google Scholar is different in that sense. And the other is about really about mission. So of course, Google Scholar profile and Google Orchid profile Orchid records, we kind of profile in the first instance. But if you look closely, so in Google Scholar, it's actually how it's more about citation. So it's more about, you know, you need, they will, the, the, the core function is about to, to display the citation, you know, how many publications you you got cited or how you know others how others cited yours but that's not the mission of orchid so orchid okay it's more about in display and ensure those connections that's why we always if you see my slides we always mention about transparent connect transparent connections among people place and thing so yeah so we are not okay it's not a citation platform so that's very different from google scholar of course, they serve different purposes. 
So that will be my feedback or comment towards that. Yeah, I'll leave it to you. Yes, thanks, Estelle. It, it, exactly, I think uh, th this uh, emphasize on different types of outputs being able to, uh, you know, add to your ORCID list of works and uh, having very prominently the provenance of those information is like really helpful. I I just look up my own ORCID record. I just realized I had it over for over 10 years. I my fir first register in 2013. And I have already gone used to having all those notifications come in whenever you share something. So like I really rely on these services. Yeah, like uh, Johansson, you wanted to comment. Yeah, great. In addition to uh, uh, what Estelle said and also what you just said, Shari, I think it's also about um, the difference would also come, um, I believe that most of all um, metadata or, um, or our... Um, how it is created or or curated or maintained is is mostly a community responsibility. Uh, for example, cross your eyes. Um, we um we members members um are obliged to link to link references to um other members. Okay, and then for example, um, if I'm contributing to cross of um metadata. It's I'm obliged to link my um references for the research output I'm registering to other members, and you know other members also obliged to link their references to myself as well. So it's a it's a community responsibility that leads to a collective benefit. I think that's also something different in um in addition to being open, and so um and also uh it, there's an obligation for us, for example, I believe also for uh other organizations that it's a uh, that membership. Um, that, that the all members uh, display um, the links on their site as well, and also guide people on how to cite those uh, DOI links or, or like or, or any uh, identifiers rightfully. Um, yeah, and also in 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 any other ways that they're communicating with authors or, or vendors. Yeah, so I think that's also one way that it is um it is it is different from other DOIs in as much as also um. Uh, do, the DOIs that we have here like are very highly interoperable and maybe would also take up the other um types of person identifiers as additional metadata um easily uh and uh, and engage them as well so it, it is like very highly interoperable um across so many systems and also so many systems already are using those and 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 make it quite easy or maybe a high leverage point for um researchers and organizations. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Johansson. Um, uh, okay, so here is another um, more general question, I hope. Oh, Mohammed. So, yeah, I just want to add us, yeah, no worries. I just want to add a small uh, point referring to the comment that was in the chat from Dr. Nadia Somali, who's joining us from Algeria. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadia, for joining the webinar. Yeah, she's talking about the value of uh, DUIs in supporting recognition for the gray literatures. So all the thesis, the dissertation, all these materials that are usually the primary point of publication will be the institutional uh, repository. I just want to say that we completely agree with you, uh, Dr. Nadia, and this is our vision is to support all of these research outputs and the materials, whether they are clear literature or even the associated materials that is affiliated to a specific research process, such as samples or models or data sets, making recognition for all of these research outputs, making them more discoverable and more accessible is really, really, really important. So just wanted to highlight her comment as well. Back to you, uh, Lee. Yeah, um, thanks, Mohammed. And another, you know, a uh, general question for all of us is, um, so say I'm an organization and considering to uh, adopt uh, person identifier workflows, and I want to talk to all of the organizations about how can go about doing it. Uh, what are the support uh, each organization provide to ensure that I can successfully uh, incorporate uh, these workflows to my to my circumstance? Uh, I can I start for this one? Yeah, sure. 
So I can talk about data side. So what we usually do with any interested organization is first of all, we have a conversation with them. So we will uh, invite them to have a conversation, to have to talk, to listen also what is their interest, what type of research outputs they want to register, how many repositories they are running, what is the type of these repositories. So we have that conversation to learn also about their research workflows, how they are working internally. And then uh, we can take the conversation forward by creating a test account so they can start experiencing connecting their repository with data site infrastructure, start seeing DOIs in a test environment so to start having an understanding also about that, the associated work that will be related to registering uh, DOIs for the research outputs. So they start to have an overview about that. And yeah, if they are really interested, they can we can move to the next step. They can start getting a membership and join uh, our community. So this is just a quick overview about, you know, how we uh, approach that at that site. Thanks, Mohammed. Myself? So, uh, yeah, go next. Yeah, just also quickly. Yeah, just, yeah, I think it's always starts from conversation, just as Mohammed um, shared. So at Orkin, we, as I sh also shared in the slides, so we have a sandbox. It's a mirror of our production so just apply uh, fill in the form and you can really try out apis for a more technical point of view but uh, a successful working integration will require more than just technical so we, yeah just let us know first and of course we need to talk and we need to identify the workflow you are interested in and the system you are going to integrate with orkit and meanwhile we also work hard to with different service providers different system providers so that's why we have the certification program. So you can, we have the OK service provider certification program. So we really want to ensure more system support ORCID. So, you know, if you are, if you're very interested in ORCID, you can just turn on that functionalities. That, yeah, that's kind of the support. And we have technical support colleagues that we provide that technical support. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, conversation is key. Uh, Johansson, wanna very briefly, we have one minute left. <laughs> great, thank you. I, I, I yeah, great. I, um, I'll talk about uh Roar, uh, because I, I made that presentation today. I, I um, so I, mostly uh the Roar uh is is curated by the community, but also um, if you not on if your organization or affiliations are on Roar, you can always uh suggest to be added. Or is it just a form that you feel you'd be added? Uh and, and then um after two to four weeks there, but then you then uh that that will be captured as well. Great. Yes. Uh thank you so much. So we are at the end of the hour. Uh I would like to thank all of our speakers today and thank all of our attendees for dialing in to having this conversation with us. I hope this content has been helpful for you. And uh, as I mentioned, the next uh, Better Together webinar will be in uh, September 4th. And uh, all of the recordings and slides from this webinar will be shared uh, in a follow-up uh, email. Again, thanks for joining. And we look forward to seeing more uh, engaging uh, activities with, with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. Nice Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.